Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness to us today. Thank you for this beautiful Sabbath that reminds us where we came from and where we're going. Father, in our desperate need today, we pray for the Holy Spirit to overshadow our meeting, to speak to our hearts and our minds as only you can. And when you speak to us, I just pray that our hearts would be soft and humble to accept whatever message you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's open with a few Bible verses. Uh, Isaiah 44, verses 21 and 22. Beautiful promise of Scripture. Isaiah 44, verses 21 and 22. The Bible says, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel. Of course, Jacob and Israel were God's children, so this verse would apply to us. For thou art my servant, I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. So in this very impersonal, unkind, and hard world, God says, I'm not going to forget you. Verse 22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. You know, just now before the service, I was out there in the uh, fellowship hall, looked outside the window for a minute, and there's some very... Uh, puffy clouds up there in the eastern sky and it reminded me of these verses right here in Isaiah 44 number one that God will not forget us number two that he blots out as a thick cloud our transgressions and as a cloud our sins and he says return to me for I have redeemed thee so the clouds in the sky, the prophet Isaiah, through the inspiration of God's Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, God wants us to learn two things whenever we see clouds up in the sky. Number one is, is that God will never forget us. And number two, he will blot out as a thick cloud our transgressions and as a cloud our sins. I'm so thankful today that God speaks through nature and it's so beautiful how the Bible prophets use the things of nature to speak very personal truths to our minds. Another one I find in Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7 verses 18 and 19. The Bible says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Now, I remember listening to Corey Ten Boom, the famous Dutch author and speaker, who stated after she was in a concentration camp during World War II that um, the soldier that had been most cruel to her and had been very instrumental in the death of her sister Betsy at a very, very volatile and, and cruel prison camp there in, the German, in Germany. It was called Ravensbrück. And as the soldier had listened to Corrie Ten Boom speaking in this church in Germany, she was standing at the door after the service and then she saw this soldier walking down the aisle. And she knew that within a matter of moments, 
she would have to shake his hand. And as he approached, he held out his hand to her and he said, Fräulein, I heard your sermon this morning about f forgiveness for the German people, but he said, I need to hear it from you for me personally. Well, folk, that was the last thing that Corey Ten Boom had on her heart that morning because the anger and the bitterness and the animosity that she felt for that man was very, very real. And then she began to pray because that man had his hand stretched out like that. And she, in her story, The Hiding Place, she says, it seemed like an eternity that he had his hand outstretched. And then she prayed that God would empower her with the Holy Spirit to be able to shake that man's hand. And she said all of a sudden her hand darted out and she said, Brother, I forgive you. I forgive you. And then Corey quotes this Bible passage in Micah chapter 7. And she says, when God forgives and cleanses us from our sins, he casts them into the depths of the sea and he puts a sign up. And that sign says, no fishing allowed. No fishing allowed. So the next time you find yourself either at the Gulf of Mexico or you find yourself uh, at the Atlantic Ocean or maybe just at a lake, know that if you've confessed your sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and to cast your sins and my sins into that body of water and there is a sign there that says no fishing allowed. This morning we're going to pick up our third part in our series on Ezekiel. We're going to be looking in Ezekiel chapters 4 and 5. So if you have your Bibles Please turn there. We're going to look today in Ezekiel chapters 4 and 5. Fernando, your pointer I'm going to have to bring here to church and put it right here on this pew. The warning. Ezekiel part 3. All right, sweetie, let's go. Jeremiah has warned apostate Judah repeatedly to surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. You see, Nebuchadnezzar first came into Jerusalem in 605 BC. It was during that captivity that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were taken captives. Because of Judah's hardness of heart, because of their rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar, he came back eight years later in 597 BC. So now twice Babylon has come in and assaulted not only the sanctuary but has also taken many of God's people captive. Jeremiah has repeatedly called them to repentance. He has repeatedly told them that their captivity in Babylon would be 70 years. All of his counsels, all of his entreaties and warnings have been in vain. When the truth of God has been rejected, lies become the order of the day and the devil had plenty ready. You see, folk, the message of Jeremiah back in the 6th century was not welcomed. People were not interested in hearing what Jeremiah had to say. Because Jeremiah was saying that apostasy among God's professed people was going to be punished. And the people didn't want to hear that. The people in Jeremiah's day wanted to hear the ship is going through. That's what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear a message that made them feel like, okay, 
I can continue to sin. I can continue to choose to rebel against God. But I'm one of his people. So therefore, I'm going to end up in the promised land. That's what God's professed people wanted to hear 2,500 years ago. And I think we can tell that things really haven't changed very much, have they? They haven't changed. We're still the same today. And when we accept the lie that no matter what we do or no matter if we choose a life of sin, that somehow we're going to end up in paradise. Folk, it didn't happen back then. And it's not going to happen today. It's just not. Next slide. When people choose that life of habitual sinning against God, there will always be somebody who will give a message that helps people to feel comfortable in their sins. It's always that way. It's always that way. Well, we find it in Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah chapter 28, verses 1 through 5. Notice what the Bible says. Jeremiah repeatedly said, we're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. Now, notice what this man said. It says, it came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, in the fifth month, that Hananiah the son of Azur, the prophet, which was of Gibeon, spake unto me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priests and of all the people, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now listen to what Hananiah said. Within two full years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So Jeremiah said there would be 70 years. And what did Hananiah say? Two years. Two years and all of the captives of Judah are coming back home. Nebuchadnezzar will be stopped. It was a lie, wasn't it? But the people loved the lie because it meant they could continue on in a life of sin and everything would be okay. Now, do we have that today? <laughs> you know, I don't know how many of you were listening to a program that was aired last Thursday night on Three Angels Broadcasting Network. How many, did any of you hear that? It was called Nightlight from the uh, ASI meetings in Cincinnati, Ohio. Did anybody hear that? Nobody did, okay. The only reason I knew about it was because of a number of people on the different prayer lines that I'm on on Wednesday and uh, Wednesday mornings and then Sabbath uh, afternoon. So they emailed me and said there's going to be this forum talk, this panel discussion over the issue of spiritual formation amongst us as Seventh-day Adventists. I thought, I'm interested. I'm going to watch some of that. Well, it started 9 o'clock Eastern Time, Thursday evening. I watched for about a half hour. I was getting sleepy, and I was getting nothing out of the broadcast. So I went to bed. Folk, I found it fascinating. The man who leads 3ABN, now a man by the name of Jim Gelly, or Gilly, he made a comment in the opening remarks as he was sitting there with Danny Shelton. And Jim Gilley said, you know, this whole issue of spiritual formation, it's kind of crept in amongst us. And we didn't know anything about it. And then all of a sudden, oh, it's here. You know what I almost yelled at the television set? 
Now, fortunately, I was in watching it by myself, so if I had, nobody would have thought I was crazy. Folk, that's a lie. That man lied by the skin of his teeth. It didn't sneak in amongst us as a people. Folk, it was voted in by the General Conference Committee back in 2001. It was voted to have it come in and to be taught to every leader in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Now, is that something that snuck in? Come on. That was a bold-faced lie. And I almost said, you're a liar! Because that's exactly what I thought. Folk, to hear that something has snuck in amongst us as a people, oh, but now we're going to deal with it in a panel discussion that it's not rampant across Seventh-day Adventism in schools and in churches and at Andrews and Walla Walla and Southern and Loma Linda. Folk, if Jim Gully had told the truth, the Seventh-day Adventists watching that program would have been up in arms. But as it were, Jim Gully is a false teacher, and I'll say that again, as a false teacher tried to make everybody feel comfortable. Oh, don't worry, we're going to deal with it tonight, and then it'll all be gone. I had a gentleman last Sabbath in Chino Valley, Arizona, that told me his son was taking the Masters of Divinity program at Andrews University, and he is being taught in spiritual formation. Come on, folks. Come on. It's rampant amongst us as a people. And anybody that's going to take a hook and say, Oh, but, but they dealt with it in the panel discussion Thursday night. They dealt with nothing Thursday night. Just like Hananiah. Just like Hananiah. Two years, Nebuchadnezzar will be gone. It's a lie, folks. The idea that Islam today is somehow the Antichrist power. It's a lie, folks. It's a lie. There's so many lies out there today. And they're getting worse and worse and worse. Next slide. Well, Ezekiel comes along in Ezekiel chapter 4, and that's where we're going to pick up this morning. Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. So did Ezekiel confirm what Hananiah said? Or did Ezekiel confirm what Jeremiah said? Well, let's take a look. Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Notice what the Bible says. Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile, lay it before thee, portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. So Ezekiel's to get a, a clay tile, and he's going to make a picture of the city of Jerusalem upon this tile. What did he write on it? And lay siege against it. Oh, lay siege against it. Build a fort against it. Cast a mount against it. Set the camp also against it. Set battering rams against it round about. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan. Set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it. It shall be besieged. And thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. So why did God give this picture to Ezekiel? It's to say, Ezekiel, there are false prophets in ancient Adventism. Let them know. Let the people know that these false prophets and teachers are telling them lies. Let them know. And that's exactly what Ezekiel did. Ezekiel confirms that Jerusalem and Judah and Israel are about to be sacked again. 
Next slide. Nebuchadnezzar has already attacked the city of Jerusalem twice, once in 605, once in 597 BC. Ezekiel begins his ministry in 592. Prophets in Judah are telling the people that they will be free from Babylonian captivity in a few years. Jeremiah and Ezekiel declare trouble for apostate Judah. Trouble. Trouble is coming. Ezekiel said, for God's professed people. I wonder what Jeremiah and Ezekiel would declare today. Do you think they would get up and say, you know, we're going to keep right on sinning till Jesus comes. And then Jesus at that moment is going to change us. Do you think Jeremiah and Ezekiel would say that? Do you think Jeremiah and Ezekiel today would begin to rewrite Seventh-day Adventist teachings as we see people doing today? Do you think they'd do that? Do you think they'd declare that now Islam is the Antichrist? Do you think they would downplay the spirit of prophecy? Next slide. Ezekiel chapter 4, 4 to 6. Ezekiel is given a very interesting command. He was told this, Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days. Three hundred and ninety days so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel? Now, folk, I can lie on my side for, what, 10 minutes? Maybe 20? But then what happens? You get tired. Your arm starts to fall asleep, and you start to get that prinkly feeling in your hand and in your arm. And that's what happened. Can you imagine Ezekiel was told, do it for 390 days? The Bible says that when Elijah fled before Jezebel, do you remember he went in the strength of the food and drink that he had taken? For how many days was it? 40 days. And you remember when Moses was in Mount Sinai? Do you remember how many days he was up there and he didn't eat anything? How, how long was that? Forty days. Obviously, folks, God gave special, supernatural power that enabled Elijah to do what he did, Moses to do what he did, and now Ezekiel to do what he did. And it was to teach, friends, an object lesson that the children of Israel were in bold apostasy and it would be a 390-day period for which Ezekiel would lay on one side. Now you say, what's that 390-day period? Well, we'll look at that momentarily. Notice verse 6, When thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So there was a 390 year period in which Israel was in apostasy. There was a 40 year period in which Judah was in apostasy. And so Ezekiel would lie on his left side 390 days. For Judah, it was for 40 days. And notice this biblical principle that I hope we never forget. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So Ezekiel laid for 390 days. The 390 days represented 390 years. The 40 days for Judah represented 40 years of apostasy. Friends, this is a biblical principle that we find laid out not only in Ezekiel 4 but also in Numbers 14 
that a day equals a year in Bible prophecy. So the time periods in Daniel and Revelation, the 1,260 days in Daniel 7.25, the 2,300 days in Daniel 8, the 490 days in Daniel 9, do not represent literal days. They represent prophetic years. And we find that repeated again and again in the book of Revelation. Next slide. The two time periods represent Israel's falling. Now, this is what I have seen, folks. If you find something better, let me know. But the 390 days representing Israel's falling began around 975 B.C. with the rise of Jeroboam. And, of course, Jeroboam was the man who split the kingdom of Israel in half the two southern tribes went with Rehoboam, the ten northern tribes with Jeroboam. Jeroboam was in apostasy from the get-go, started around 975 B.C., and then, of course, Israel utterly collapsed around 585 B.C. with the third invasion by Nebuchadnezzar. The 40-year prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 4 for Judah was from around 625 B.C., which was the beginning of Jeremiah's ministry, down to, again, the ultimate and final collapse of Judah right around 585 B.C. The year-day principle is outlined in these passages. Ezekiel was given supernatural strength to fulfill this request. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes prophets are asked to do strange things, aren't they? Do you remember the man who was asked to marry a prostitute? What was his name? Hosea. Hosea. Strange. Strange. Ezekiel lying on one side for that long. Strange. Very strange. But God has a purpose for each of those object lessons that he seeks to teach through those experiences. Next slide. No prosperity gospel here. Notice what Ezekiel says. This is through the remaining part of Ezekiel chapter 4. The Bible says, Therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's not going through, friends. The ship is not going... What is the ship that goes through? Who was it that went through in the days of Jeremiah and Ezekiel? Who went through, friends? Who was it? God's true people. And God's true people are set apart... Because they follow Christ and his messages. What about those who claim to be God's professed people, but were in absolute apostasy and were resisting God? Did they go through, friends? No, they didn't. They perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Let's... Keep an object lesson here. Ezekiel said, punishment is coming. And it came. And it's coming again. Thine arm shall be uncovered. Thou shalt prophesy against it. Behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. Why? He said, I don't, like, I don't like to hear messages like that. I want to hear something that, that makes me feel good. I, I want to hear that there's going to be prosperity and that, you know, God's people are going to turn around and, and everything's going to be all right. You know, if we say that, friends, we're just lying. We're lying by the skin of our teeth because it's not going to turn around. It's not. 
first selected messages, page 204 and 205 says that storm and tempest will sweep away the structure of Seventh-day Adventism. You say, oh, that, 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 that could never happen in my lifetime. Oh, really? Did you know that the Columbia Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, the Columbia Union up in the northeastern or north central part of this country, they just recently voted to have women be ordained as pastors. Did you know that? And that is completely at odds with the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. When Ted Wilson, the president, heard about that, he said, there will be dire consequences for what the Columbia Union Conference has done. Do you know what, friends? Within the next 10 days, the Pacific Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, the most wealthy conference in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, is going to vote on the ordination of women pastors? Do you know what could happen, friends, if the Pacific Union Conference voted to have women pastors and basically was severing connection with the authority of the General Conference? Friends, we could watch First Selected Messages, page 205, happen right before our eyes. Storm and tempest will sweep away the structure. Wake up, friends. Wake up. A siege. Babylon had sieged Jerusalem. They had surrounded Jerusalem. And Babylon is surrounding Jerusalem today. Take thou also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and fitches and put them in one vessel. Make thee bread thereof according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon thy side. 390 days shalt thou eat thereof. Thy meat which thou shalt eat shall be by weight. 20 shekels a day from time to time shalt thou eat it. Friends, that's a, a ration, a food ration. Why? Because things were getting very bad in Israel. Very bad. Why? Because of apostasy. Apostasy. So there was, Ezekiel was told, you're going to eat rationed amounts of food. You know, I had a gentleman call me this week from California, and he said, Bill, what do we do with these verses in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 that talk about uh, people at the end of time telling others, commanding them to abstain from meats. But what do we do? Here, here in Ezekiel chapter 4, just like in 1 Timothy chapter 4, what does this mean? Food. That's exactly right. It means food. So Ezekiel's food, he would have to weigh it out for rationing of food because there would be famine among God's professed people. Same in 1 Timothy chapter 4. The use of the word meat simply means food. The Greek word is bromata. Thou shalt drink also water by measure, the sixth part of a hen, from time to time shalt thou drink. Thou shalt eat it as barley cakes. Thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. And the Lord said, Even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles. Whither I will drive them. Ration of food, ration of drink, bad times, bad times. Why? Because of Israel's apostasy. Judgments would fall upon apostate Israel. Next slide. 
This goes to the end of Ezekiel chapter 4. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, my soul hath not been polluted, for from my youth up even till now have I not eaten of that which dieth of itself, or is torn in pieces, neither came there abominable flesh into my mouth. Now there, the word flesh means flesh. It means the eating of animal body. Then he said to me, Lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung. Thou shalt prepare thy bread therewith. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem. They shall eat bread by weight and with care, and they shall drink water by measure and with astonishment, that they may want bread and water and be astonished one with another and consume away for their iniquity. How about America, friends? Is America always going to be that great, marvelous, wonderful nation? The, the one superpower in this world? Friends, God, God cannot watch much longer what is happening in this country. Judgments are in the process of falling today. And they will continue. You say, oh, but, you know, Bill, I'm sure that if, if Romney gets in, he's going to change. No, he's not, friends. He's working for the papacy just as Barack Obama is. There will be no change. There will be no change. The judgments of heaven will fall, not only on apostate Adventism, but they will fall on apostate America. Next slide. The foolish prophets and teachers in Israel and Judah were telling the people lies. Friend, are we listening to lies? It's time to stand up and oppose the lies. It's time to protest lies. Instead of sitting back and saying, I sure like what they're saying. All will be well within a few years, Hananiah said. Don't worry. Don't worry. Everything's going to be fine. No, it's not. Hananiah was lying by the skin of his teeth. And we see that very same thing today. Stop listening to lies, friends. Judgment, sure, swift, and powerful, was on its way. The ancient Adventists had forged their own fetters. Nothing could turn back the forthcoming judgments except a repentant heart. You know, it's interesting, friends. The, um, you know, when we talk about a Sunday law, friends, a Sunday law is going to be America's last effort to save itself. To think that the way to forego and to escape judgment from heaven, it will be by passing a national Sunday law. In reality, friends, a Sunday law will be an attempt to save America, not from sin, but to save America in sin, in rebellion against God. Next slide, sweetie. And somebody says, well, you know, Ezekiel, he's, he's too harsh. He's too harsh. Bill, I don't like what you're saying. That, that's just too harsh. That, that just, you know, there's no hope in that. There's no encouragement in that. I, I want to be encouraged. I like Jesus. But I don't like God in the Old Testament. That, that's just too much. He was too harsh. The Godhead, 
Come on, friends, now think about it. Was the God of the Old Testament different from Jesus Christ? No, it's the same God. It's the same God yesterday, today, and forever, Dennis. The God had labored for a few thousand years to win Israel's heart. They continuously and stubbornly refused his messages. They despised his commandments and the results are always the same. Do you realize how many times Christ begged and pleaded and sought to win Israel's heart, friends? They did it for thousands of years. And when God could then do no more, judgment was the result. The Christ of the Old Testament is the same as the Christ of the New Testament. Jesus wept on the Mount of Olives. Why? Because every attempt to save Israel had been rejected. And so Christ wept because he saw that judgments were about to fall. Next slide. Ezekiel chapter 5. Ezekiel chapter 5. The Bible says, And thou, son of man, take thee a sharp knife, take thee a barber's razor, cause it to pass upon thine head and upon thy beard. Then take thee balances to weigh and divide the hair. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are fulfilled. And thou shalt take a third part and smite about it with a knife. And a third part thou shalt scatter in the wind and I will draw out a sword after them. So it says some will burn with fire. Some will be smitten with a knife. Some will be scattered to the wind. A third would burn. A third would be hit. And a third would be scattered. What's Ezekiel talking about there? Troublesome times were ahead for ancient Israel. For ancient Adventism. Why? Because they were choosing a life of sin. And so God finally had to withdraw himself. And the judgments would fall. And Ezekiel said a third of the people will die in the city. A third of the people will be smitten with the knife. And a third of the people will be scattered to the wind. A third of the people will go and be spread all throughout the world. You know what's fascinating to me? There are nationalities, ancient civilizations from the past. There aren't any more of those people. They've disappeared from off the face of the earth. But you know what? There are still Jews. There always will be. There always will be Jews. They've been scattered to the wind, friends. Thou shalt take thereof a few in number and bind them in thy skirts. Then take of them again and cast them into the midst of the fire. Burn them in the fire, for thereof shall a fire come forth into all the house of Israel. This is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. She has changed my judgments into wickedness more than the nations. My statutes more than the countries that are round about her. They have refused my judgments and my statutes. They have not walked in them. Here's the whole issue, friends. Will we submit ourselves to the authority of God's law or will we not? If we choose to, then God will be with us. 
If we choose not to, then judgments will surely fall. Next slide. Finishing up in Ezekiel chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord God, Because ye multiplied more than the nations that are round about you, and have not walked in my statutes, neither have kept my judgments, neither have done according to the judgments of the nations that are round about you, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, am against thee, and will execute judgments in the midst of thee in the sight of the nations. Christ wept over Jerusalem. Now, isn't this interesting? I, I got a kick out of this caption here in this photo. Jesus wept over Jerusalem and today he ever lives to make intercession to the Father. What are they saying by that? What I got out of that, folks, is, is that, see, Christ wept over Jerusalem back then, but today he's there to intercede for us. He wouldn't weep over us. He wouldn't. Would Christ weep over us today, friends? You bet he would. Is he weeping over this professed church, Seventh-day Adventist church today? Is Christ weeping over modern Adventism? You bet he is. Is Christ weeping over this nation and a world that is running away from him? You bet he is, friends. You bet he is. I feel like the caption here would have been better, Jesus wept over Jerusalem and today he is weeping over mankind as well. Next slide. Most people today want to think that, oh, you know, what happened back then, that was for those people. But God's people today, you know, we're not going to have any problems because we're going to be, whoop, raptured away. We're just going to somehow go poof, and we're going to disappear into the heavens. That's not what the Bible teaches, friends. That could never happen now, what happened in the days of Ezekiel. As it was in the days of Ezekiel, so it will be now. We're going to be raptured away? No, we're not. Sin will be punished. Nellie's comment is, is it'll probably be worse for us because we have greater light. We have greater light. Next slide. Ezekiel 5, 9 to 13. Folks, in light of what brought judgments on ancient Israel, in light of what is going on amongst us as a people, and what is going on in the nation where we live, friends, we have a responsibility to awaken people, to alert people, whether they like it or whether they don't. You know, last Wednesday, I was on the prayer line. Somebody had asked me about a month ago if I would give some talks on the evangelical conferences of the 1950s in which the Seventh-day Adventist denomination united with apostate Protestant pastors, Walter Martin and Donald Gray Barnhouse. And from that time in the mid-1950s till now, you can't compare the Seventh-day Adventist church. What it was back then and what it is today, friend, it's as different as night from day. It has been in a state of abject apostasy for the last 60-odd years. Well, after the meeting was over, somebody came on the air and said, we appreciate what you shared today, 
because it was true, but we really didn't like what you said because it helped us to see our true condition. And friend, my response to that was, is I didn't come here to be your friend. I came here to tell you the truth. And if the truth, truth hurts, I'm sorry. But the truth is still the truth. How it would be wonderful to return to following and accepting the messages of the prophets of old instead of taking the false prophets of today that are preaching smooth things. Friends, God help us when what we want to hear is somebody itch our ears rather than to come up with the true facts of our condition as a people and as a nation. Ezekiel chapter 5, 9 to 13. I will do in thee that which I have not done, and whereunto I will not do any more of the like, because of all thine abominations. The fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of thee, the sons shall eat their fathers. I will execute judgments in thee, and the whole remnant of thee will scatter into all the winds. Wherefore, saith the Lord God, surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things, with all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee, neither shall mine eye spare Neither will I have any pity. Now here comes the third parts that we read in Ezekiel chapter 4. Or at the beginning of Ezekiel 5, excuse me. A third part of thee shall die with the pestilence. And with famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee. A third part shall fall by the sword round about thee. And I will scatter a third part into all the winds... I will draw out a sword after them. Thus shall mine anger be accomplished. I will cause my fury to rest upon them. And I will be comforted. And they shall know that I the Lord have spoken it in my zeal. When I have accomplished my fury in them. Next slide. Desire of Ages, page 582. The Bible calls God's judgments his strange work. In Isaiah chapter 28, it says, He will bring to pass his strange work, and he will perform his strange act. Often they had heard him, Christ, declare that he came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. They remembered his words, the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Luke 9, 56. His wonderful works had been done to restore, never to destroy. The disciples had known him only as the restorer. This act stood alone. What was its purpose, they questioned. When Christ cursed the fig tree, God delighteth in mercy. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's Ezekiel thirty-three eleven. To him the work of destruction and the denunciation of judgment is a strange work. Isaiah twenty-eight twenty-one. But it is in mercy and love that he lifts the veil from the future and reveals to men the results of a course of sin. 